All right, let's get our Bibles out and let's get into Psalm 31. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and we will get one to you. If you don't own a Bible, please let that be our gift to you. I want you to leave here with scripture, but if you just don't have it with you, then leave that Bible um, on the seat and we'll reuse those things. So again, Bibles are a couple hands over here. Am I the only one that just wants to tip this and see what happens? Such a punk, huh? All right, Psalm 31, Epulokako. Oh God, thank you for your great, great and amazing grace. And as we, again, look at this powerful psalm today, I pray that you would protect us from familiarity, that you would protect us from just cognitive Christianity. Lord, that we will truly understand what assurance does. Not just what it is, but what it does. As we see David being very transparent for us. And so Lord... Bring that message into a transforming God. We don't need information, but transformation today. And so for that miracle to happen, we need that to be a work of the Holy Spirit. So may I and all of us now decrease and you increase in us. And let the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be right in your sight. Our Father, Maker, Savior, Redeemer, and Friend. Teach us now, Lord. Your kids are listening. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, well, as I mentioned last week, today is part B of a two-part in Psalm 31. In this amazing book, this amazing chapter, if you look at your notes from last week, remember Psalm 31 is a psalm of trust, struggling through tears to triumph. And so it is trust that brings us through tears to triumph. To triumph, And that's what this whole thing is about. And we saw that it was in three sections. And last week we looked at the first part, and that was this. The double sense of trust and trial. Another way of saying it was the constant struggle we face of what we know versus how we feel. And they do not cancel out each other. What we know and what we feel. And what we wanted you to grasp last week was this. When you are feeling these feelings of overwhelm, fear, whatever it may be, it does not mean that you are in a crisis of faith. It means you're in a crisis. God gave us all of our emotions, and that's that whole sermon I made, meaning where it says uh, learning to live as you feel, the feelings that God gave us to feel. Because fear, in the right context, done wisely, is to make us run back to Papa. And so it is to draw us to the Lord. And all the emotions that we have show us our need for his mighty goodness. Amen? Amen? And so we've been looking at this constant struggle of what we know and how we feel. And let me tell you, as I'm going to talk a lot about today in this message, it is very relevant because it broke my heart in so many ways to watch so many in the body of Christ be so affected in the last two years by how they felt and how they felt overrode what they knew. I heard a lot of, I know God's got us, but, and as we all know, when the word but comes, it almost pretty much cancels everything that you just said in the first part. I know he's going to do something in here, but, and so the overriding fear was a real revelation, I think, maybe for some. Someone taught me years ago that Christians are like tea bags. You only know how strong they are when they're in hot water. And we really want to reflect today and look and understand what it is. Because my whole point in the message last week was this. When a believer can have full assurance in the Lord, it will change their world. Amen? So let's look at what was the taught that we learned last week in here because it's so powerful. Remember right there in verse 1, David started out affirming where his trust is. You should have that written down. He starts out and he says, in you, O Lord, in you. And again, as I challenged you last week, saying it. It's not that I'm saying that we believe in positive confession or that I speak something into existence. But when you and I verbalize something, what it does is it doesn't activate God, it activates us. When I tell Cindy, I love you, I seem to feel a love for her more. When I tell her you're beautiful, I seem to admire her more. You understand what I'm saying? And so when I say everything's coming at me, you know, but Lord, it's in you, I trust. And then he says, it's in you, I take my refuge. Remember that word? What was refuge? 
Hasa, exactly, Hasa. And what is Hasa? It says it right there, to take refuge in, to go to a place where one will find safety, rest, or comfort, implying that the place of refuge is a place to be trusted and kept safe. And so when you say it's in you, I Hasa, I said it's best to remember that we can Hasa with Papa. And so when we go to him, you're the one I trust. I'm not going to trust in pastors, churches, governments, doctors, vaccines, whatever it is. I'm not going to trust in who's in the office of the White House, whatever it is. It's in you I trust. Then we will not find ourselves being fooled. Amen? So we learned that we all encounter the four seasons of life. We have winter, spring, summer, fall in our lives. And when we go through these seasons, we can either let them break us or build us. And that's what we want to understand. Because when you and I, if we, when we have full assurance in the Lord, we will find freedom and rest to let go. To let go. So important. He said, into your hand, I commit my spirit. Into your hands. I'm, it's, it's yours, God. I'm, I'm going to step back. And we talked about how we seem to hold on so much. And we think we can come to church. We can be in our quiet time at home and pray. And then we walk out just carrying it. In fact, as a young man at 15 years old, I came across a poem that was so powerful to me that I wrote it in very, very, very bad pencil grammar. And Eng um, uh, what's it called? Penmanship there. It says this. That's the great thing about having your Bible forever. You have this that journey, this the journal of you. It says this, as a child brings their broken toys with tears for us to mend, I brought my broken dreams to God because he was my friend. But instead of leaving him in peace to work alone, I hung around and tried to help in ways that were my own. At last, I snatched them back and cried, how can you be so slow? My child, God said, what could I do? You never let them go. And there is that whole point of what is God doing in your life? Exactly what you've let him do. Have we surrendered? Have we truly cast our cares into his hand? And then I want you to look at verse 3 before we move on because the other important element was where he said, for your name's sake. When you are in a relationship, when you have a love affair, not a law affair, your heart's desire is for the other person as well. And for us as Christians, God, I don't want to shame the name. I don't want to live in a way that would cause someone else to blaspheme, to say, oh yeah, that's why I don't believe in God. Look at those people. They call themselves Christians and dot, dot, dot we've all been there we've all heard that and David's heart was God I want to respond in a right way for your glory that there is no bringing any shame for your name's sake God I want to live victoriously so today we're going to get into the second and third section and then it's the second section right now verses 9 through 18 and that is this sense of feeling that the whole trial is overwhelming at this point in time it seems to have overcome the trust. It's like the winter season where things are cold and lifeless and a lot of crying and sobbing in a sense. And so it's fully about how we feel. First part, what we know. There is both God and trials. They're a part of life. And we say yes. Now, how does that make us feel? And so I want you to look at verse 9. And if you've got a place in your Bible, you can put it down. Is here's David, the man of God, as the Bible talks about. The one after God's own heart. He's the one now that is describing how he feels. I want you to feel some comfort in that. That again, this man that the Bible talks about being a man of God after his heart is feeling these feelings. My point you are not weak in your faith. You're having a weak moment. Doesn't mean you're less than in a Christian. The trial comes, be legitimate on how you feel, but then legitimately take it back to the source, to Papa, and find Hasa. Amen? Okay, so let's go. Verse 9. Be gracious to me. If you have a new King James, have mercy upon me. O Lord, for I am in, what does he say? distress. Now here's an idiom. My eye is wasted away from grief. It means extreme weakness. My soul and my body also, talking about the whole person, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing, meaning he's fully suffering by this condition he's in. My strength has failed because of, what does it say? Okay, I'd like you to circle that. We'll get to that. Because of my iniquity and my body has wasted away. 
So in the first eight verses, he talks about what he knows. But now misery moves to mercy. This is how I feel. But now I'm crying out to you, God, to do something. Have mercy. Be gracious to me. That's the prayer. And one commentator put it this way. Look overhead. It says, the cry of David here is as prevalent as it is plain and personal. I am in trouble. We in these days are not strangers to the double sinking which David describes. We have been faint with physical sufferings and distracted with mental distress. When two such seas meet, it is well for us that the pilot at the helm is at home in the midst of the water floods and makes storms to become the triumph of his art. Now, obviously, with such poetic language, this is Spurgeon. But as you can see, this is what he's speaking about, is that he is not in the back of the boat asleep as we had that time with the disciples. It says God is at the, in the boat with us and he will be at the helm if we will let go and let God God, because God is not his name, it's his job description. So the point is, is that we have the trials. It's where do we go with them and what do we allow to happen? Do we let God be at the helm? Let him captain because there cannot be two gods in our life. Verse 10 says, my strength has failed because of, I think that's important, because of my iniquity. Now, I want you to understand something. I mentioned this several weeks ago. We can be very guilty as Christians especially today's present Christians, to overlook the source of our pain and suffering. As I mentioned, there is the context where there's a whole group that if there's anything wrong in your life, it's because it's sin in your life. And people pray for you and you didn't get healed. Oh, it's because you have too much sin in your life. And that's why the only things bad happen is because there's sin. And so there's that total abuse. But then there's also this mindset that we have today that if I have a headache, if I have a physical problem, if I'm dealing with exhaustion, whatever it may be, it's, oh, I got to run immediately to get just an aspirin or go to a doctor. Have we first stopped, dropped, and prayed and said, God, is this your hand upon upon me? Is this your correction getting my attention? As David says, I understand where I'm at right now is a consequence of my sin. It says, and my body wasted away. And so too often we just ignore perhaps the very core of what could change our physiological suffering. It's all throughout his Psalms. Just go to the next one, Psalm 32. It's one of my favorite Psalms. I preach from it a ton, so I'm not gonna do any, steal any thunder from it, but I want you to see at verse three, David says, when I kept what? When I kept silent about my sin, my what? My body wasted away through my groaning all day long for day and night your hand was what? Heavy upon me, my vitality, my energy was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Salah. Think about it. Man, when I tried to bury that sin about Uriah and I didn't bring it clear, man, it was just like I was exhausted and I felt so much pain and I realized that this was the hand of God which is upon me. And that is why it's better to be sighing than sinning. It's better to be at a point where we're recognizing God is trying to get our attention because of his love for us. Now, you see, the thing is, is that sin can be very alluring. If it isn't something that one would enjoy, it wouldn't be a temptation. No one here has been tempted to eat raw liver. Right? Okay, if so, yikes. I've never been tempted to hit myself in the head with a two by four. Okay? But sin can feel good for a moment. Even the Bible suggests that. It may taste sweet, but it will turn to poison. When it speaks about Moses, when he was in Egypt as a young Pharaoh in the land where he could snap his fingers and get whatever he wanted being in the house of Pharaoh. When he realized his calling was to be with the people and he followed them, this is what Hebrews 11, the great faith chapter says about Moses. It said, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the, notice the what? Passing pleasures of sin. Three words there, passing. It may feel good for a moment, but this too shall pass. 
pleasure, yeah, there's a point where the flesh itself can enjoy whatever it is, but the consequence is because it is sin. And so it is going to have its destructiveness in our lives. As I said last week, oh, because I listened to God, I'm so sad that I never had to deal with diseases. I didn't have to you know, worry about whether or not she was pregnant or worry about if I would be found out. You know, duh. No, 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 no. And so there's this passing pleasure. There's consequences of us reaping what we sow, but there's also God's hand of correction on us. You see, the point is we can needlessly give a portion of our strength away because of sin. Amen. Now, family, think about it. We are in a culture that is obsessed with energy additives. Energy drinks, energy this, energy that. Everyone talks about being so exhausted. You go to the aisle and it is no shortness of drinks and pick-me-ups and commercials. all about getting more and more energy. And yet you and I look at our own culture and we see how far we have moved away from God's word, will, and... You think maybe there might be a connection according to what the Bible says is that we're just exhausted because we're not getting rest. Why are we not getting rest? Because of the unconfessed sin that is in our lives. So perhaps, family, if you're one of those who is struggling daily just to get through 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, you're just like, oh my gosh. Perhaps it's not one of these that we need. Perhaps it's just a little papa, hasa, confession time. Search me, O oh God, and see if there be any wicked way within me. When we first start feeling any kind of condition, we take inventory. Lord, is there something in my life that you're drawing attention to? Something that I did do or something that I didn't do that you asked me to do? Lord, is this your hand? And as we go through that, if there is nothing there, then we can then go on to the next thing and we can seek the other remedies. But the point is, is that we stop, drop, and pray. David's saying, I know what I'm reaping right now is what I had sown. Verse 11 says, because of, that word because, is the Hebrew word men, meaning it gives the reason for the cause and event. So he says, because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Please note that it says neighbors and acquaintances. And it says, and those who see me in the street flee from me. <laughs> huh. I know what that's like on the different side when some folks have not been in church for a while. And then they see me in the grocery store and they run to the next aisle. Like, I didn't see you. But the point is, he says, because of what's happening to me on this external, it's a cause and effect, but now what is happening to me because of that, even my neighbors and my acquaintances, someone once says, those who are nearest stab the sharpest. Those who were closest to us, we feel the most pain. Think about Jesus and his hour of trial that here Peter completely denies him. Judas fully betrays him. The rest of his whole posse, they run and disappear. They forsake him in his hour of greatest need. Well, here's David in his hour. And perhaps maybe all of his friends feared now to be identified with him as there was an attack against the throne. And so they recognize maybe David is on the way down. So let's be favorable to the one who is coming in that they might win mercy, that they might win favor of the new opponent. Hmm. What does that tell us? Self-interest always rules the day with the flesh. Amen. Self-interest. We can be all of a sudden, hey, I'm all for this. But hey, if here's an opportunity for me to be able to climb the ladder, for me to be able to preserve my position, my status, my wealth, whatever it is, then I'm going to forget what I said, forget any pre previous loyalties. I'm going to make the decision that's best for me. And that's what David is seeing here. But that is not the case for us. We are called to a better and higher standard. Amen? Amen. Remember, this is what it says in Philippians 2. Rabbi Paul, who knows a little bit about position, leaving from being a high Pharisee to a servant of God, he says this in Philippians 2 verse 1, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, notice, if there's any of these things, if you've stepped into God and you understand what he has done for you, if there is any of this in your life, Verse 2, make my joy complete by being of what? The same mind, maintaining that same love. So 
we get the blessings of Jesus, then what was Jesus like that we would be the same? United in spirit, intent on one purpose. And what is that one purpose? Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's not look out for number one. It's not what can I do that's best for me. It's what is God calling me to do and how might I even bring others up or even set others up higher than myself. Served to be a servant here. Blessing to be blessing. And so understanding what he's calling us to do. But as David explains, all who have ran after self-interest, then he says in verse 12, I'm forgotten. So remember, he's talking about how he feels right now. I'm forgotten as a dead man. I am out of mind. I am like a broken vessel. Pretty powerful when you recognize that he says, I'm forgotten. You see how quickly we can forget our obligations and our promises and all the faithfulness of someone. I think it's so tragic in this culture today of this cancel culture. I mean, Cindy and I have had people who we have known 10, 20, 30 years. And then there's one thing that they find themselves in disagreement with, and all of a sudden, the entire posture of everything that has ever been done, all the faithfulness and servitude and, and, and prayer and relationship with that person just gets completely set aside. It's like, oh, I thought you were a Bible teaching church. We are a Bible teaching church that just disagrees with what you're saying. <laughs> we can agree to disagree. One does not cancel out the other, amen? And yet, here's this thing, oh, I am forgotten. I just walked away. Again, it's about my self-interest. I don't want, you don't agree with me. Thus, that threatens my insecurity because I'm not others-minded. I'm self-minded. So I'm going to counsel you. David is feeling this and he says the recipient is like a broken vessel, a useless thing, something that is worthless, cast aside, forgotten. Did that picture come up and go already? The jar? He's saying, this is how I feel. This is what's going on right now makes me feel. What a sad condition for a king to be explaining how he feels like this. But let's also remember the condition of the king of kings. What he endured and what he went through in his hour of denial and betrayal. You know that same passage that we read about being others minded. It continues and talks about Jesus where it says have this attitude. So follow along with me overhead. Verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped, it wasn't thinking just about himself, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he did what? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death, where? Death on a cross. What is the point that Paul was making in this section? Eyes this way for a second, please. He was saying, when you say in you, God, you are my trust, you are my God. You are saying, you know how I know what I feel. You know this because you experienced it. You were there. You experienced suffering. You experienced laughter and betrayal, joy. You experienced all of these things as Hebrews 2 and Hebrews 4 talk to us about. We have a great high priest who can sympathize because he experienced everything. And so he's saying he understands what it's like even to the point of the death of the cross. How good is it to know that when we come to Yahweh, he's not just some force or miss, but one who can look you in the eye and say, I know, I understand, I've been there. Amen. How good is that? You know, when the Bible says don't grieve the Holy Spirit, well, you can't grieve a mist. You can't grieve some power. So let us be reminded it is the person of God and this love affair that he longs to have with us and that we can have with him. And so David explains this feeling of just being left out and forgotten. And God is, yes, I know what that's like. Verse 13, for I have heard the slander of many, terror on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they schemed to take away my life. 
Perhaps if you weren't with us last week, you weren't familiar with the fact that what's going on now is what we find in 2 Samuel chapter 15 and 16. When David's own son Absalom decides he wants to be the king, so he rises up an entire rebellion, a coup, to remove his father from the throne. And not just remove him from the throne, but from the planet Earth. And so here he has this whole rebellion, but what makes it even worse is Ahithophel, who was David's trusted servant, the one who went alongside him with all the victories we've heard before. He now turns against David and sides with Absalom. And then all those within his court, they do the same thing. They're like, whoa, we're going to step. Nobody said, I got your back. I'm with you. They run. There's lying lips throughout all the nation as the rumors that Absalom started and people are beginning to believe them. And then to add insult to injury, literally insult, if you remember Shimei, as David is fleeing with his wife and children to protect them, here's this guy who was a descendant of Saul and he's throwing rocks at King David and saying, yeah, you man of bloodshed, this is God's punishment on your life for all the bloodshed that you spent and with things that you did to Saul. <laughs> if you remember what he did with Saul is he honored him all the way through. Amen. I think the wounds that hurt the most is when somebody says something the exact opposite of what you strive to be. And so here is all of this when he says insults, slander, terror on every side. He's running for his life literally to protect himself and his little babies. And yet in all of this family, David's faith did not fail him, nor did God ever forsake him. How good is that? This full assurance. Once again, we see the power of... Oh, that was really weak. More than Johnny and Tina ought to know that one. With all of this that's going on in his life, he did not lose his faith because he had the power of assurance. assurance. It's not what we know. It's the implementation of this. God, this is how I truly feel. He wants us to come honestly, not kind of come, oh, it's all good. It's all great. No, you feel fear, you tell him. But you bring it to the Lord. He didn't get on the phone. He got on his knees. He brought his feelings to the Lord. And so because of this power, and that is why when he brings it with assurance, now we shift into the next gear, spring. This is where we begin to find encouragement because he shifts it now from what he feels back to what he knows. This is where hope and expectation comes like a refreshing rain upon him, like a sunny day. Look at me in verse 14. Look with me there. But as for me, I, what's it say? I trust where? In you, O Lord, I say, what? You are my God. You know what? Let's just say verse 14 together. Ready? Go. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. Interesting. We go right back to the same point in verse 1. What does that tell us? We need to constantly repeat to ourselves from what we feel, but bring us back to what we know. And where is my assurance? Where my trust is, it's in you, O Lord. But it doesn't just stop there. He says, you are my God. Now, I seem like I'm beating this stick forever, but I want this to be something that I see in the flock living Because let's remember, he says, you are my God. And I've said, that which we think about most, that's our God. That which we're most afraid of losing, that is our God. And that which we've placed our assurance in, that is our God. And so as I've watched in the last two years, people who are saying, yeah, you are God. And yet all of this sense of feeling hopeless and insecure and anything could threaten my life at any moment. Well, it seems like holding on to my life or my security has been revealed as being more of the God than Yahweh, who we can say, you know what? You're in charge. Not Fauci, not this, not that. You are in charge. In you, I put my trust. Oh, what a joy it is into your hands, commit my spirit to let go. This isn't my job. This isn't my burden. This isn't my worry. I can truly cast my cares to you because you care for me. Are you hearing me? Amen. See, there's this understanding of what assurance truly does in our life. We can bring the feel, but then we are assured by Papa. You see, he says in verse 15, my times, it's in you, God. You're the one I trust. You're my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. 
What a beautiful compliment to verse 5. Notice his language. Verse 5, into your hand I commit my spirit. Right here, my times are in what? Your hand. Deliver me. When you understand, <laughs> I don't know if there's any 70s Christians out here, but put your hand in the hand of the man who stills the water. Okay, I see like four people smiling at me. <laughs> put your hand in the hand of the man who calms the sea. Okay, never mind. <laughs> but what I want you to get in the imagery here, he says, into your hand I commit my spirit. My time, it's in your hand. Meaning all that's going on, whether I live or die, all of the worries that I have, concerns that I have, it's in your hand. And what I want you to understand is this imagery. When you see a child reaching up and holding on to their parent's hand, and for our sake here, father, they're holding on to the father's hand as they walk down that hallway today as you see after service. What is the child doing? They're looking all around and enjoying the ride because they know the one that has their hand is going to get them safely to their destination. One is churchianity, the other is Christianity. One is just a bunch of rules and law. The other is a love affair with a father who knows you, dies for you, rises again, has a plan to prosper and not to harm you, will cause all things to work together for good. Amen? Amen. You see, where is your hand? And as we have stated already, when we find ourselves in a trial first, take inventory. Lord, is there something in me that needs to change? And if that is found clear, then not only do we have the right, we have the blessing to say, now God, deliver me. Because I know your hands are for the purposes of blessing. So God, I just come to you, but how you do it, when you do it, is in your hand. At last I snatched them back and cried, how can you be so slow? My child, God said, what can I do? You never let them go. Think of it. And what I love is the language that David uses. His language is not just seeking some problem solving. It's about the relationship of intimacy. Look at 16. Make your face to shine upon your servant. I want to be face to face with you, Papa. Save me in your loving kindness. Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent and sure. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak errantly against the righteous with pride and contempt. Who does David ask for God to bring or for the correction to happen? He says, God, you take care of them. You take care of them. I'm not going to get up all night and, and craftily word this thing so I can send that out and go boom and blast back with those who send accusing things to us online or whatever it is. Lord, you take care of this attack, this slander against me. And I love the fact that he said in verse 3, hey, I don't, I'm not going to shame the name. And then he says, and God, I ask the same. I ask that you would guard me as well in my life, in my ministry, in my calling before you. My point, scripture family, all through it from Genesis to Revelation is a reminder to us that God is your deliverer. Amen? Not just of sin, not just of, of, of all the things, but he is your provider in all things. It says in Philippians, he richly supplies all of your need. Amen? The battle belongs to the Lord. Let him be your defender. Let him be your provider. The battle belongs to him. And the fun part about that verse, as I've taught you, is it's actually a victor's cry. When two guys box, then they come together and they're standing there. The officiant says, and the battle belongs to, and he raises the hand of the victor. The battle is the Lord's, and he's already won. Amen? Wow. Our point here, if it's God's job, don't step in and mess it up. <laughs> I love that laughter. Thank you. Because we can. You see, David brought his problems and his feelings to the Lord and let go. I know that's speaking to someone. Professing and proclaiming his faith and assurance in God. No matter what, he is professing and proclaiming his 
assurance in God, no matter what, what I see and what I feel. Notice what happens when you can do that. Then comes another feel. So now what I know is God, you got me and you love me. Now comes a feeling, but a feeling that is based on assurance. Now comes summer, that beautiful warm glow of summer. And notice what he now begins to say. Verse 19, it says, trust has completely triumphed the whole sense. Now he has this beautiful sense of safety. Verse 19, how great is your goodness, which you have stored up. I love that. I mean, there's an abundance of goodness for those who fear you, which you have wrought for those who take refuge. What? Please circle that in you, that whole thing. Hasa, my hasa is nowhere else but in you. Before the sons of men, you hide them in the secret place of your presence. From the conspiracies of man, you keep them secretly in a shelter from the strife of tongues. Powerful verses. I loved how the New Living Translation put this in his paraphrase. Look overhead. Taylor put it this way. How great is the goodness you have stored up for those who fear you. You lavish it on them, those who come to you for protection, blessing them before the watching world. I love that. You hide them in the shelter of your presence, safe from those who conspire against them. You shelter them in your presence, far from accusing tongues. We see in both translations two times that there is a shelter in the presence of God. You shelter them in your presence presence and I cannot get past the imagery of this when you see a small child and they see something coming someone coming and they're fearful they what do they do they just go and they stand right behind them and then they peek out see in the presence they find shelter of the parent will you remember that God will never leave you nor forsake you Christian amen it's in his presence that he's, you are there and you have the shelter. You have the shelter. But hasa comes from papa as we gather behind. And that is what David is saying. Oh, I feel this total security because I know you are there. He has full assurance and he gives glory to God for the mercy that he is assured will be there. Verse 21, blessed be the Lord for he has made marvelous and loving kindness to me in a besieged city. <laughs> Look. Threat and death is still all around them. But Lord, your loving kindness is what I'm looking at. As for me, I said in my alarm, when I was in most fear, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplication when I cried to you. Oh, love the Lord, all you his godly ones. The Lord preserves the faithful and faithfully recompenses the proud. He brings the judgment upon them. Be strong and let your heart take courage. All you who what? Hope in the Lord. Wow. Be strong and let your heart take courage. All you who hope in the Lord. See, when you have assurance of who your confidence is, then you're as strong as the object. And that's the point. If your object is God, who is large and, then so also is your insurance. Amen. Verse 23, just, oh, love the Lord, you godly ones. My point, even in a moment of doubt that David was feeling, when he was unsure that God saw him, he says, I said in my alarm that your eyes were not upon me. God never took his eyes off of David. And what was the result of his assurance in God, no matter what he felt? David was now again filled with hope and courage to face whatever was still to come. I think that's very practical advice for us in a world who is ever changing so quickly. Amen? I mean, who would have thought five years ago we would be in the things that we are today? But God remains the same. So here's the application for you. Is Jesus Christ your Savior and Lord? Now I have to say, as a loving shepherd, as a Papa in the faith, I know that the majority of you have Jesus as your savior. But the struggle that I watched many of you go through was the absence of the Lordship. Lord is not his last name, it is his title. In the same way that God is not his name, it's his 
job description. The Lord is the one you would say, yes, my Lord. He was the master of the castle, the one who would bring the provision. And when folks started feeling fear, when folks started feeling the sense to hide, when folks started needing to make these things, was it under a context of full prayer and seeking the Lord and his guidance and call on our lives, on your lives? Because when God guides, God provides. And you see, my heart for you is, is that you would find the freedom, the rest, the peace of lordship. Yes, Jesus, you are my savior. You died on the cross. But the best part is you not only saved me from my sin, you saved me from myself. Amen. That ought to be a chee <laughs> He saves us from ourselves and all of the fear and all of the worry and all of these certain things that we feel we must be connecting. Oh, I have this, but God is where my assurance is. Is Jesus your Lord? That means you have full dependence upon him for your eternity, for your salvation, as well as every other need here on earth. Amen. Family, that is available to you today. But only when you let go, when only when you say, it's you, it's you, O oh Lord. One commentator put it in a devotion this week I loved. Let me share it with you. It says, throughout scripture, we see countless examples of God meeting with people and countless lives being transformed as the result. These examples are in scripture to stir our faith and fill us with the desire to meet with our creator. When we read about the life of David, we ought to be filled with a longing to live as he did, centered around meeting with our heavenly father. When we read about Gideon or Moses, we ought to long to know our God as they did. When we read about Jesus coming down to us or his heart for the woman caught in adultery, we ought to respond by pursuing encounters with our Savior. And when we read of Pentecost and Jesus' second coming, we ought to seek out the fullness of God's presence available to us on this earth in preparation for the age that is to come. May your heart be filled with a wholehearted desire to pursue meeting with God today. Amen. Amen. The Bible as I teach is not what God did. It's what God does. And thankfully, miraculously, as a young man, probably around there in junior high, I began to understand what this devotional is saying. Because we had a phrase when we would see something, we're like, ooh, give me some of that. And I would see Jesus in the boat, I mean, walking on the sea. And Peter got out, and I would read down and go, ooh, give me some of that. I want to do that. I want to get out of my boat. And everybody talks about the fact that Peter sunk because he took his eyes off the Lord. Yeah, but the other 11 weenies never knew what it was like to walk on water. Because <laughs> only Peter said, give me some of that. That's what it says. Lord, if that is you, bid me come. Translation, give me some of that. <laughs> Moses, man, take an entire people and move them out and they're going to grumble. I'll do it, Lord. Oh, give me some of that. Gideon, yeah, I want you to take a 30,000 army and bring it down to 300. Wow, Lord, such obedience. Give me some of that. And you see, as we go through the scriptures, it's not what God did, it's what God does. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the assurance throughout the scriptures for us to see our God is faithful, our God loves us. He sacrificed everything for you and me on the cross. How can I not trust him with everything else? Amen. Oh, I pray that you learn the love affair of being Christian. Is he your savior though today? That's the first thing. It's not just that you believe that these happened. Have you given him the permission? As I said, what is God doing in your life? Exactly what you've asked him to do. Whatever you've stepped back and given into his hands. But whether you're watching online, listening radio, or whether you're with us right now, he can't move in such ways until he is the savior to move into the Lord. 
And that begins by you honestly saying, God, I need you to forgive me for my sins. That's how I can say my trust is in you and you are my God is when you first say my trust is in you to forgive me just as I am. It's not clean up your act and follow Jesus. It's come to Jesus right now as you are and watch what happens to your act. If you could have done better, you would have done it before. Let God do it. Step back. Put your hands in the hand of the man who stills the water. Aloha, I'm Gordon, and I'm the director of children's ministry here at One Love. And I want to say thank you for tuning in today. We hope that you are inspired and strengthened by today's celebration. If you're new to One Love, we encourage you to visit us online at onelove.org and fill out a connect card so we can keep you up to date with all the things that are happening here. While you're there, you can also learn more about One Love, submit prayer requests, or see more of our studies through the Bible. There are many ways to stay connected, so we encourage you to take that first step. If you're watching today's celebration via YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe to our channel and click that bell icon to keep informed with new messages. Most importantly, if you made a decision to follow Christ today, we encourage you to click on the I Said Yes to Christ link at the bottom of our website and fill the form so we can stay connected. One last thing, if you want to learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to visit goodnewshawaii.com. There, you'll find five short videos about living a life in Christ and a free discipleship booklet designed to encourage your new faith. Mahalo for tuning in to One Love Today. We hope you were blessed by our time together. Aloha.